Gospel according to Luke chapter 10. We're going to read from verses 38 through 42. If when you have it, say amen. Who's got it? Say amen. 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 Luke chapter 10 verse 38 through 42 in the NIV version reads like this. As Jesus and his disciples continued on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You're worried and upset about something or many things. But only one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen what is better. And it will not be taken away from her. Amen? Mary has chosen what is better. And it will not be taken away from her. As you look at the persons next to you and as you take your seats, just tell them to sit back and relax. Actually, you can sit. Sit now. Sit. Sit back and relax. Jesus. We've come to the third week of the series, I Quit. The first week, if you've been blessed, I know I have. I'm, I know I'm preaching it, but God has been working in me and through me through the series. If you've been blessed through this series and through what the Lord has been speaking to you, can we just give God a thanks? Give him a thanks. Give him a thanks. I want to tell everyone to just relax. <laughs> Someone's laughing at me because he knows I can't relax. So to hear this from me is really interesting. I want to tell everyone today to sit back and just relax. Amen? Sit back and relax. See, today I want to focus through this story on we need to quit the it-alls in our life. The it-alls. What is the it-alls in our life? We need to quit it all. You've ever, um, even in this story, you'll see this. Where is the, the most active, where is the most action in a home? Except for divine design, folks. Where is the most action in the home? Where? In the kitchen, right? The most action happens in the kitchen. Usually even when you have people over, a lot of people congregate around and in the kitchen, right? That's why we try to build our kitchens out accordingly so we can have space for gathering. We have our islands, we have our stools, we have everything that we can. Because we know that eventually, somehow, even when people come over, even when we're just home alone, most of the action will be in the kitchen. And usually in every home, in my home too, we come back home from our daily routine and we get the routine of getting dinner ready and getting the kids uh, prepped for dinner and you know there's a whole process to that right but then after all the long day after the all the action and all the the work that happens in the kitchen and all that working in the kitchen then there's a point in our house around 8 30 8 45 that everything goes quiet in the kitchen and we have couches in our family room downstairs. And usually I sit here more often than Cher does. She can witness to that. And we come out of the kitchen, that busyness, that working, all that action, and we just kind of just, don't we? We go to our dens, we go to our family rooms, we go to our couches and just find that spot. Oh, man, our couch, we sleep on it every night. In the middle of the night when we all wake up, we're all sleeping in, the, in our family room downstairs. Because that couch is so comfortable. You just relax in that area. You just relax and just say, hey, I'm watching TV. I'm going to watch the kids play around. I'm going to play with the kids. I'm going to just do, you know, get on the iPad, do my online shopping. Whatever you got to do, you just relax in this area on that couch in that living room. You just relax. And that's what the Spirit of the Lord wants to speak to 
many of us, it's time for us to find some time to relax. We've been very chaotic and very busy and very action-packed and we're always moving, we're always striving, we're always just doing so much that we need to take a moment to just plop down on our couch and just say, and let, down, let out that deep breath. Like, oh, right? Say, so, oh man, the night is coming to a close. See, in this story, you see two sisters. Martha and Mary, they heard that Jesus was walking through their village and they, I guess they had to be outside in the, in the streets or in the community somewhere to get his attention. And they got his attention and they invited him over. You know, being the hospitable people they were, they invited him over. And he actually said, yes, I'll come over and I'll come in. Imagine that. When you invite Jesus, he actually decides to come in. Imagine that. How many people are sitting here, we've saw Jesus, we've heard about Jesus walking in, but we haven't had the audacity or the faith to actually say, hey, Jesus, would you come into my home? We're happy and it's sufficient for him to just walk by our home. It's, it's okay. It's good enough for him to just, you know, hear about us and see us from a distance. But the Spirit of the Lord wants to speak to all of us today. Invite him into your home. Invite him into your situation. He is ready, willing, and able to come in. You've been trying to do it on your own, but Jesus said, hold on. If you invite me in, I'll come in and we'll figure this thing out together. Amen? You're asking me, what is the, I quit it all. And in this story, Martha, you see it from the perspective of Martha. And my prayer and my hope is this. That you see in this scene that Jesus comes into the house. And where does he sit? Where does he sit? In the kitchen? No, right? Because Martha's doing work in the kitchen. And he, she's doing all the preparations to make sure Jesus is pleased and he's happy. And he found his place where? In their living room. And in their living room, they had a nice leather lazy boy couch reclining in their living room, right? And he just went there and he just sat. If my helpers could come, uh, Sammy, Abby, Layla, just come. He just sat in the living room. And he was just waiting to see who was going to come sit with him. See, my prayer through this talk today is this. That we'll see where we are sitting. Or where is our vantage point, our perspective in this scene. Are we like Mary sitting at his feet? Sitting with him, relaxing? Because at this vantage point, they could look at me. Layla, Sammy, Abby, if you look at me. This is one perspective that they have. Very up close and personal. But if, if we just keep a hold on, pause over there, and we come over here, Mary's working, I mean, Martha's working, Martha's doing so much, and she's like, she's looking over there like, how is Mary, what? Mary, come here, help me. That's what she's saying, right? Say, I'm doing all the work here, Mary, how are you just sitting there? And this vantage point from Martha's perspective is a very different perspective. From this distance, from even a little higher up, you're looking down on a place where Jesus is sitting. And you're standing and saying, you're looking down towards Jesus. And, Jesus, and you're, I was wondering if, if people were over at our house and my wife told some of our guests to tell me to go help her, how would I feel? Right? That's what Martha did. Martha said to Jesus, 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 don't you see I'm working hard here? Tell my sister Mary to come and help me. How about if you were told by your guest your guests were a little channel through which your loved one or your family and the people that you live with told got to your, the message in front of you. That's disrespectful, isn't it? That's a little disrespectful. But I want to share with you, I want them to stay there and I want you to just picture that scene there. And I want you to picture this scene of Martha working hard here. She's working. She knows that Jesus is in the house. She's trying to work, work, work to make sure that Jesus has everything he needs. But Jesus did not come to see you work. Jesus came down to sit with you. What is the I quit it alls? Quickly, I quit it all. Here are the three I quit it alls. 
I quit trying to be it all. I quit trying to do it all. And I quit trying to know it all. Amen? I quit trying to be it all. I quit trying to do it all. And I quit trying to know it all. How many of you have those people in your life, like the know-it-alls, right? They try to, do, they have to be it all for everyone. They have to do it all for everyone. Amen? That's what Martha depicts here in this story. She's trying to be it all for the house. She's trying to be it all to make sure that Jesus sees that she's trying to do it all. And then she's saying to, um, to Jesus, hey, Jesus, don't you know that I need help here? You're telling Jesus that knows it all. Don't you know? Don't you know that I need help here? Jesus in his mind is like, wait a minute. Wait till I get to you right now. I know what's going on here. Remember, once again, this series is not about the outside. This series is about the inside. It's not about us, about us working on the outside to show that we got it all put together. We put on a nice mask and we try to put on a good show. We're trying to put on the, the mask of perfection. And we're saying, hey, I'm going to show you that I got it all put together. But really behind the mask, why do we have to put on the show that we have it all together? Because when we really take off that mask and you look down on the reality, there's really a mess on the inside. We have to put on a good show on the outside. We clean up our house on the outside. We make sure our landscaping is looking nice. We make sure the living room looks nice. We make sure the rooms, I think Sunil spoke to you here once. Like we'll make sure when people come over, the rooms that nobody will go to, we won't touch. All the garbage goes into those rooms, right? But we'll make sure the rooms that the people will most likely go to, we'll make sure it looks pretty, the flowers are dusted, the room is ready, everything's vacuumed, everything's clean. We'll make sure that, but when we truly go deeper on the inside of the house, you'll see where all the mess went. You see, when in verse 40 and 41, it shows that Martha... But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Why do we try to, you know, in, um, I guess, I don't know if it's in certain spheres, there's a, there's a, a name for this um, issue. It's called overfunctioning. We overfunction, meaning we do things for others what they could do for themselves. Because we think we know it all. We think we could be it all for everyone. And we think we could do it all for everyone. But then we take on a role that we were not designed to take on. And what happens when that role starts to be playing out in our life? Here's the results of wearing this mask of profession, perfection. Three things happen all through the story. You get busy. Amen? When you try to be it all, do it all, and know it all, no matter what, how, how hard you try to manage your calendar and your time, you're going to get busy. Amen? Sammy didn't like Jesus. <laughs> he rested enough. He's good. He's relaxed. No matter how hard you try to manage your calendar, you're going to be busy because somebody else is going to have a problem and you think you could be it all for that somebody and then you're going to go find time where you have no time. Try to find energy when you have no energy to go be that all for that person. When you know they're capable of doing something, but you know that you have to do it because you need to do it all. And you get busy doing that. Because I know it all, I know I have all the answers. I know everything about everything and everyone and every little thing about everything that needs to be known. I know it. I got to put my two cents into everything. And then somehow that hooks us and gets us trapped into a place of we got to start doing it all and being it all. Because we said that we, or we thought we knew it all. Three things happen. We get busy, and when we get busy, we get distracted. That's what Martha said, right? It says that Martha was distracted with all the preparations. Number two, you start blaming. She started blaming her sister because she was doing all the work. Why are you blaming your sister when you decided to do all the work? You'll find out shortly that your sister decided the better thing. 
when we start getting busy, when we start to overfunction, when we start to do it all, be it all, know it all, we'll start to blame others because they're not doing everything I'm, not, I'm doing. How come I have to do all this work and they don't? Why? You chose to be it all, know it all, and do it all. Why are you blaming somebody else? But that's a natural result of when we try to do, be this and play this function of being everything for everyone, doing everything for everyone, and knowing everything for everyone. And now the third thing that happens is burnout. If, listen, eventually there's only so much you can do. There's only so much energy that God has given to you. You know, here's, we're going to come back to the scripture, but here's a scripture that I believe sometimes is very misquoted. It's the scripture, Philippians 4.13. I can do all things. Right? I can do it all through Christ who strengthens me. I can be it all. I can do it all. I can know it all through Christ who strengthens me. That's our crutch. We fall back. Hey, I'm going to do this because I can do it through Christ. Yes. I'm going to be a friend over here when, and I'm going to try to pour out into people when I got nothing inside of me to pour out. But I'm going to be it all for them because I can do it through Christ who strengthens me. You eventually will burn out. And some of us are burnt out already. Martha is coming from a point of burnout. She's getting to a point of burnout there. You see, when you see her story, even in the other script, in the other gospels, she's always on the move. She's always moving. She's always got something going on. She's always doing something. It comes to a point where you're busy, you start to blame people, and then eventually, when you know that the blame is not going to be received and blame is not going to work, you eventually keep going, keep going, and eventually you'll burn out. And when you burn out, you start to hurt the people around you. But it's not on the outside. What is on the inside? It's the deeper worries on the inside. It's the anxieties. If I don't project into a certain image of everything is great, then if I don't keep this mask on, and this, guess what? Keeping the mask on and projecting the show and the image is a lot of work. It's a lot of work to put on a show that you're not meant to put on. <laughs> Here's a, this is not any of the three, but this is something that came to me when you try to be it all do it all and know it all for others let me speak to the situation you're really stunting their growth right over functioning is you're doing things for others that they can do for themselves but you don't allow them to do it for themselves and you're doing everything for them and you're re really you think you're mature and maturing but you're really just breeding immaturity See, you know I, know, I know someone that loves their kids. And I'm, I'm a, you, if you can know me, I'm a delegator. I'm a, you know, empower people. You know, even if they mess up, empower and teach them, keep going. Even with my kids. When I'm at home in the mornings, my oldest, she gets ready, done, ready to go. And she's, she's waking me up in the mornings. Sure, just found that out. But when mama's home, she knows how to play the card. And mama loves playing the card. At this age, it's fine, it's funny, it's playful. And it's not just about us and kids, but whoever in our lives, if they're able to do the things they're able to do, let them do it. If you don't, they don't mature. They don't grow. They don't become who they need to be. They don't get learn the abilities they need to learn because we try to do it all, be it all, and know it all for them. We're all going to make mistakes. We're all going to fall down, right? We're all going to learn, but we got to know that we can't be the answer for everyone, every time, and every way. They got to learn that we're not all the answer. We don't know everything. But there is somebody that's waiting for them to get into their presence who does know everything. Who can be everything. And who can do everything. See, when you quit it all, there's something you need to know. You need to know his power. Amen? You need to know his power. There, there's, Martha's working there. Jesus is sitting here. And Mary and all her friends are just sitting and relaxing. 
There's a couple things, a few things we need to do. First of all, know that Jesus is in your house. When you have Jesus in your house, quit working. You already got him in the house. What more can you do? When you have him in your house, enjoy him. See, I tell our teams and stuff, uh, people here, when there is a move of God in this place, stop what you're doing. Enjoy him. We're not saying don't prepare, don't plan, don't get everything. I'm not saying that. You got to do your best and get ready. But when you have a, come, a move of God and God shows up in your house, God shows up in your life, stop doing everything. He's already in your life. Now enjoy him. First, find rest. Find rest. Find rest. Psalm 62 verse uh, 1 and 5 reads like this. If they could put that up, Psalm 62, verse 1 and verse 5. It says, find rest. Truly my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from him. Verse 5. Yes, my soul finds rest in my God. My hope comes from him. Two things that come from him when you rest. Your salvation comes and your hope comes. Not in the kitchen working, but when you're sitting at his feet, resting in him. Number two. You, you need to find rest. Take a break from working. F sit down, relax, rest. But as you get that breather that you need, that refreshing that you need, there's one thing you need to find yourself rooted in or you need to start abiding in John chapter 15, verses 4 and 5, and then verse 8 reads like this. John chapter 15, verse 4, 5. Remain in, Jesus speaking, remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful apart from me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. After you find your rest for your soul, abide in Christ Jesus. Stop trying to strive. Stop striving. Start abiding. Blessing, that's a word for you. Just find, make a rhyme to that. Stop striving. Start abiding in him. Stop striving to get him to pay attention to you. He's in your presence. He's in your life. Now just rest and abide in him. Because it says there, apart from me, you can do. But no, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. No. Apart from him, you can do nothing. You need to rest. You need to abide. And last but not least... I come to Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Hmm. Wait, see, you've been speaking. You need to quit doing it all. But now you're telling me, do it all? We got to take perspective of what we've been doing. See, our all and God's all are different. Our doing all is different from God telling us, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When we're doing all on our own, I promise you, we're not doing it through Christ. We're using that verse as a crutch to say, I can do all things. That's not what the verse intended. The verse intended to say that when I am in Christ... When I'm abiding in Christ and I've already before that found my rest in his presence, I find my rest, I'm abiding in Christ, and then when I'm in him, I can do all things. See, we're trying to do all things without abiding in Christ. We're trying to do and work at doing all these things, but he doesn't want us to work at doing all these things, rest and abide and do all these things. You know, I always w watched um, my mom over the past few years, and I always wondered, how does she do all this? And if you know her, if you don't, his wife, mom, pastor's wife, grandma, caretaker for uh, an elderly mom, 
And to watch all the details of what she did, I'm not going to go through all the details now, but to watch from a distance and from up close to see how she did it. And she did not ever one day say, I'm tired or I'm burnt out. That's one thing I noticed. She never said, I'm burnt out, because when you talk about, her, about each individual aspect of her life, she loved going to work. She loved being at home. She loved taking care of my grandmother. She loved being at home with uh, her husband. She loved being a pastor's wife. She loved those things because I, when preparing this, this came to me as like, how come she never got burnt out doing all this work? Physically taxing, physically wearing out, but not really burning out on the inside. Because I truly believe that she was resting in him, abiding in him, and then she could declare, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. See, it's not a bad matter about doing less or doing more. It's a bad matter about what can we do when we're resting and abiding in Christ. I promise you, if we're finding rest and abiding in Christ, I bet, I don't, I don't bet, I promise you that you can do more than what you're doing on your own. And you will not get burnt out. You will not get tired. You will not get busy. You will not blame others. You will not burn out because you're not doing this on your own strength. But you're doing this because you were abiding in Christ. And before that, you were finding your rest. Finding your rest in the presence of Christ. See, we're not finding our rest in the presence of Christ. Sitting at his feet. Hearing everything that he's got to share with us. Spending that intimate time with him. And then we're not abiding with him knowing that apart from him, we can do nothing. We don't have these two st steps in place but we're always here in step three trying to work god i can't do this i can't do this i'm tired i can't do this anymore why because we are not abiding and resting in christ i believe this is a picture of law and grace you try to do all the work on your own trying to get jesus attention to jesus to love you because if you did all this love no he doesn't want you to love he doesn't want to love you because of what you did he wants to love you because he wants you to sit at his feet he knows what he did for you grace doesn't say that you got to do something you deserve what you you get what you don't deserve right you get him at your living room. You get him at your feet. You get him sitting. He, you got him sitting in your living room. Take at that moment. Enjoy him. How about just relaxing? Take a breather and just relax with Jesus. See, I'm speaking to somebody here that feels like, you know, when you're running a marathon, which I've never done and I never will. When you're running a marathon... There comes a point around the 16 to 20 mile mark in the marathon that you start to, your energy starts to sap. You're, you're almost like, oh, I got to give out. That burnout mode is coming in. But then there's something that they call in the, mar in the runner circles, a second wind. A second wind. And they experience that second wind in their, in their body, in their mind. And they, they are able to finish out the marathon with that second wind. Some of you have been running the race of your life, the marathon of your life, and you're burnt out. You're busy. You're blaming others, wondering why am I have to do all this? Why can't I just find myself at the feet of Jesus? But I tell you this morning, God wants to give you a second wind. And all Mary did at the feet of Jesus was this. It says in a version, it says, she hung on to every word. Amen? Every word that came out of his mouth, she hung on to it. As we close our eyes in this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I just want to read the scriptures, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 through 9. But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. 
Christine Kane posted this a quote the other day, and she said it like this. He loves us broken and loves making us whole again. Amen? He loves us broken and loves making us whole again. Jesus. Folks, I, I, I'm speaking to somebody in this place. You need to quit trying to save others. You need to quit trying to save the world. And you need to quit trying to save yourself. Jesus did everything for you. Jesus died for you. You can't do anything to save yourselves. Even whatever roles that God wants you to play in others' lives, you can't do it apart from being in Christ. Holy Spirit. As we all rise to our feet in this place, if there's anyone here in this place that says, that's been trying to save your soul and save yourself, know that out of the richness of his kindness and his love, he died on that cross for you. Father God, quit trying to save yourself. Holy Spirit, if you want to just receive that immeasurable, incomparable love in your life and make him the Lord of your life for the very first time, just lift your hand in the air and we will pray with you. You're just saying, Pastor, pray for me because I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life. I want him to be the Lord that reigns over every aspect of my life. I'm a sinner. I've messed up, but I know he loves me yet. Jesus, we bless you. We thank you. Bless every life. We thank you, Jesus. As we sing this song, come to Jesus. He's sitting there and he's waiting for you to come and just sit at his feet. Stop trying to be it all, do it all and know it all. But know his power. So just sit in his presence, relax and watch what he can do through you. If you need a second wind in your life, step out of your seats and let's just pray with you. And as we have this time for the altar call and prayer time, let this not be a time of routine, but a time of true surrender. Where this is just the first step in making a shift in our mindset, or making a shift in our walk and our attitude towards God and with God.